from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston. It's the Cube, covering IBM Think. Brought to you by IBM. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Cube's continuous coverage of IBM Think 2020, the digital version of IBM Think. Wendy Whitmore is here. She's the vice president of IBM X Force Threat Intelligence. Wendy, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. With a name like X Force, I mean that that is killer name. Tell us about X Force. How, how are you protecting us? Yeah, we get a lot of interesting questions. So uh, my team is responsible for a pretty right, wide range of things. They range from incident response. So when you think of data breaches, typically organizations will call an outside firm and will jump on a plane and respond to threats on site. Obviously, right now we're jumping on a bit fewer planes, but we still are helping our customers investigate data breaches and we are on site when needed. We also have a team of threat intelligence analysts and researchers who are experts in a wide range of fields from geopolitical issues to cyber related issues to industry specific. And then we've also got a team that does data breach simulations in a very immersive environment. We've got facilities in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as within Europe. And now, of course, we're bringing all of those virtual as well. So really anything that helps our clients respond more effectively to a data breach is something that we do. So X-Force is traveling right now on empty planes, I presume. We are as needed. So many clients have certainly shifted to where their whole environments are off-site and working remote as well. But we still have clients who are asking us to work on-site. And in those cases, we have um, added in new protective gear to our you know, go bags, which are usually equipped with hard drives and disk imaging software and passports. And now we have you know, some additional equipment to bring as well. And that breach simulation that you talked about, so that's what, like a penetration test or and similar type of activities or? Yeah, great question. No, it's actually a, an immersive environment where we go in and actually simulate an entire breach for our clients. So everything from the initial attack, how they would do the data analytics to things like, you know, how do they respond to the press? So inquiries from the press about the breach, how do they do uh, media training, how they work with their legal counsel. So it's really a comprehensive immersive environment that um, simulates kind of the, you know, heart pounding that uh, occurs when you actually respond to a data breach. Well, that's awesome. So I mean, best practices in, in, in communications as well, I maybe mean, PR, I mean, that is, obviously uh, maybe something that's often overlooked, but something that you guys are applying best practice to. It, it's such a huge piece of it now, right? Uh, the, our organizations are not always graded just on uh, the breach itself, but more so on how they respond and how they communicate. Um, the good news is in that scenario that you can communicate effectively about a breach and you can have something pretty negative that happens to your organization, but if you respond, well and you communicate really effectively to your clients and to the public, um, we've seen time and again that those brands um, actually have no reputational damage and if anything, their clients trust them even more moving forward. We were early on in reporting the, so it's trying to measure the, the budget impact of COVID-19, but we were early in reporting the, the work from home shift, about 20% of the CIO organizations that we surveyed actually spending more or planning to spend more. But many weren't prepared for this work from home. They had to really beef up and not just you know, adding licenses of you know, video collaboration software, but, but security for sure, you know, VPN infrastructure, et cetera. So could you talk a little bit about how clients have responded, how you've helped them respond to that shift? Has the, how has the threat matrix you know, changed? Well, so in terms of the attack surface, you mentioned there's a lot more people working from home, right? So what we've got is over 220 million people in the United States, over 1 billion people in India alone that are now working from home. So as you can imagine, that attack surface has really increased um, from an attacker perspective, right? And coupled with that is that since March 1st, we've already seen a 6,000% increase in coronavirus related spam. So you've now got this uh, larger attack surface that organizations need to protect against, and you've got an increase in threats and threat activity that is attacking them. So from that perspective, you know, pretty difficult for CIOs who are used to defending an environment that may be more on site and now have this 
really wide range of attack surface, certainly more difficult for them um, to, to respond to. The other thing that we've seen, so one of the things that's super critical in these types of situations is to have an incident response plan and to make sure that you're testing it. So in our work that we've done both with our incident response teams, as well as with the teams that train clients in how to respond to breaches more effectively, we've seen that 76% of organizations don't actually have a consistently uh, tested or applied incident response plan, and one in four have no plan at all. So I will say that in terms of how we're working with clients, the first thing that any organization can do right now is actually um, have a plan and test it. So if you're starting from scratch, it's really as simple as putting words on paper, understanding how you're going to get a hold of your critical team members, having a backup plan in place for communication strategies if your primary infrastructure goes offline. So making sure you know how to get a hold of your personnel. If you're more mature, then what we're really encouraging our clients to do is have a variety of scenarios that they're testing against and make sure that they're running through those. So a great one to practice right now would be a ransomware attack. Uh, in particular, you know, how does your organization respond effectively to it? What do you do when you get the initial notification? Do you have critical and sensitive data that's backed up offline and not always connected to the network? If so, you're going to be in a much better spot to effectively defend against those attacks and limit any of the negative impact to them. So a couple of things I want to sort of follow up. And so what I heard was you got more fragile work from home infrastructure and you've got uh, somewhat, well, significantly more vulnerable users. I've often said bad user behavior is going to trump good security infrastructure every time. Uh, so you've got, you, you know, many more opportunities, you know, for the bad guys to get in. Um, and, and so I'm hearing that threat response is now more critical than ever. It's always been critical. I mean, you know, the communication to the board has been, hey, you know, chances are we're going to get infiltrated. We got to find it fast, and, and it's really about response, incident response. You know, we can build moats, we can build layers, but we have to put plan for that response. And so it sounds like that's something that maybe is heightened as a result of this COVID-19 crisis. Oh, it, it absolutely is. I think it's now more critical than ever. Um, I think there's two approaches, right? So one of them would be improvising through chaos which we don't necessarily encourage, right? There's a difference between that and really managing through disruption. And that's what we're encouraging our clients to do is look at how we can create sustainable processes and procedures. Um, you may have a very well-established uh, team that does response, but perhaps they haven't worked remotely before, right? So that means testing those procedures um, now taking them to a scenario where everyone is remote. You know, what does that mean? It may mean that you need to capture less data over the network because perhaps you just don't have the bandwidth or the capacity to do it. We've certainly looked at how we do that. How do we answer questions that are critically needed um, from an investigative perspective, for example, but without maybe all the resources that we, we would prefer to have. So what we're really looking at is kind of shifting in the way that we manage through these. And then, you know, you mentioned that users who maybe sometimes make bad decisions, right? We're all guilty of that because especially with that increase in spam, there's also been an increase in nation state actors who are now um, sending out new lures and new attempts to get access to environments that are related to coronavirus. So we've got cyber criminals, nation state actors, everyone and we're now at home looking to you know effectively defend so some things that organizations can do with that um, would be ensuring that they have multi-factor authentication on all remotely accessible systems so devices applications anything that can be accessed remotely should have multi-factor authentication that will help limit some of the impact as it relates to spam organizations should really be making sure they've got good email spam filtering systems and Place. And if they have the capability to send out some test emails to uh, their employees, they should do that, right? We are getting them, I will say our CIO and their office um, does it at least once a week where I know I'm getting a very well-crafted email and I have to really think twice. And it's really made me think differently about opening my email and making sure that I'm doing some due diligence, right? To make sure I know where the email's coming from. Uh, one of the things we do is also any external email is labeled external. So that way, if it's a lure that, you know, it appears to be it's coming from another employee, 
um, but it's actually coming from an external email address. That's another way to help users make some good decisions and really limit your attack surface and reduce the threat. I think the points you're making here are very important because if you think about the work from home cadence, it's a lot different. You know, it's not you're not nine to five. I mean, it works nine to five anyway, right. but your 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 hours are different. Um, you got Oftentimes you got children at home, you got dogs barking, kids are, you know, crawling all over us on, on, uh, on the video. Uh, and so oftentimes the, there's, we're, of course we're frenzied at work, but there's a different kind of frenzy. So you might not be as in tune. Uh, so you're basically saying, you know, exercise that a little bit to get people, you know, like a fire drill, uh, to really get them tuned to uh, uh, being sensitized to such phishing attack. Right, well, if you think about this from the viewpoint of an attacker, all the, those scenarios you mentioned, right, where you have a global pandemic, so we're not just talking about a regional threat like a hurricane or a tornado. Um, in a case of a pandemic or any of these types of situations, people are more likely to be reading the news, be um, probably checking social media more often so that they can get an understanding of the latest news and information that may impact them. Right, so if you're an attacker, you've got now this kind of environment of global chaos that's been created, and you can use it to your advantage because the reality is as long as there's money to be made, um, attackers are gonna wanna take advantage of that scenario. So what we're really talking about is as you're reading your work email, as you're checking your personal email, taking a step back, slowing things down um, amidst all the distractions, right? Of barking dogs and uh, coworkers now um, that may be at your house, also known as children, right? Um, so we need to really take a step back and make sure that we are slowing things down, reading and doing due diligence in opening emails that will help our um, all of the, the CIO and CISO type organizations more effectively protect their organizations and their clients as well. Wendy, you talked about ransomware earlier and I inferred from your comments that you know best practice, create an air gap, um, uh, but, but, but I'm wondering also, can analytics play a role there just in terms of identifying anomalous behavior? Um, what, what, what else can I do to protect myself from, from ransomware? Yeah, great question. So on the visibility side, which I think is what you're talking about, right? How do yeah. we detect these types of attacks? There's lots of great software out there. Um, typically what we would want are visibility at the endpoints. So usually some sort of EDR tool, which is an endpoint detection and response tool. That's going to allow us to you know, capture things like in, in the old days we would talk about um, antivirus software, right? And now you really have kind of next generation of antivirus software, which also gives you behavioral analytics and actions on the keyboard. We want to be able to detect that in any size environment. So the more visibility we have into that, the better. But aside from just adopting new technology, potentially, there are best practices steps that we can take. And I mentioned earlier about um, making sure that you understand what is your most critical and sensitive data and that you've got it backed up. And a lot of times we go into environments and they say, well, yeah, we have backups, this is great. But what they're uh, not realizing is that oftentimes those backups are connected to the network at all times. And in the case of a ransomware uh, breach, you typically then will see those backups corrupted as well. And organizations will find themselves in a position where they say, well, we don't have any valid backups now uh, that we can restore from in order to make sure that we have a safe environment. And so it's important uh, that organizations understand and do a survey of what is their most critical and sensitive data, and then make sure that's backed up offline. And I say that because it's not usually viable for organizations to have all of their data backed up offline, right? That costs a lot of money, that requires a lot of storage, but to really look at prioritizing uh, their environment, their data within it, and making sure that they can um, have access to that which is needed. And then ultimately that's going to prevent you even needing to have the conversation about ransomware because you still have access to that data. Okay, Wendy, I think you're making some really important points there. The, the tech obviously is critical. Um, people are shifting to SD-WAN, securing endpoints, uh, uh, securing gateways, but really the, the processes are, are very, very important. And I'll just you know, throw out an example. If, if I'm making a snapshot for the cloud, I'm not backed up. You better make sure that you understand how to recover uh, from that backup because just that copy is not a, not a backup. You need the proper type of recovery software. You need to test that, you know, your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. So what we want to make sure is that um, during the course of a potential ransomware attack, right, that the most critical sensitive data is available offline. Um, so I mentioned earlier that testing is one of the best things that we're recommending, right? One of the most effective preparations is having an incident response plan, testing it for particular scenarios. And so in this case, um, one of the other things that we talk about a lot is limiting the impact of a breach, right? Every organization is going to get attacked, especially in today's day and age where you've got a larger attack surface. The win is really limiting the impact of that attack and limiting the cost. And having an incident response plan and having a team of people, whether they're internal or external, that are responsible for responding to attacks is the number one cost management. Right? The number one decrease in cost is having access to that team. Um, typically, it will save an organization over a million dollars when the average cost of a data breach is about four million dollars. So that's pretty significant. And ultimately, if we can test, as you mentioned, those backups, that they are available in an offline scenario during the course of one of those IR program plans or tests, that's great. It's a win for the organization. They can ensure that that data is going to be available, and it really helps them exercise that muscle memory in advance of an actual attack. Yeah, that's all. I mean, the backup corpus actually becomes a really even more important, you know, component. Now, uh, I, I um, this has been great information. I, I, where can people go specifically as it relates to COVID nineteen? I mean, I want to I want to go look up a checklist to to make sure. I mean, I've been scrambling right to to get my my home workers, you know, up and running, get them productive. But boy, I really want to focus now on the things that I should be doing to to button up my my organization. Where where can I go to learn more about this? Yeah, so there's so much great information out there, right, from everyone in the industry, but IBM is clearly no different. So what we've done is actually repurpose the IBM.com homepage, where we've got a tremendous amount of information on COVID-19, and then IBMsecurity.com as well. Our team that focuses on breach response um, has, a, in particular, a site called X-Force Exchange, where we're sharing indicators and we have a um, particular component that's related to COVID-19 specifically. And then lastly, we've got a free service, which is a threat intelligence enclave that we are hosting with our partner, TrueStar, that is specific to COVID-19, where industry organizations can sign up and then share in real time threat indicators related to this and um, have really that intelligence that's been also qualified by their peers. And many large organizations are using that to defend their environments. So a lot of great resources out there. Wendy, you're an amazing source of knowledge. Thanks so much for, for coming on theCUBE. And thanks to the X-Force team, you know, doing some travel when necessary and, and helping people really you know, get a handle on this in, in this crazy crisis time. So thank you very much, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And certainly stay safe and thanks for having me on. Back at you. All right, and thank you everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. You're watching our continuous coverage of IBM Think 2020, Digital Think. Be right back, right after this short break.